one. Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here. We're at the end of week three, uh, which has been a journey through kind of interactive fiction, text adventures, and other kind of back to basics sorts of multilinear storytelling. Um, so on Tuesday, we looked at Borges and the Thousand Year Old Vampire. Um, and now we're thinking about kind of the broader spectrum and things that students actually can use to play around with. Uh, so today became a meditation on twine, um, which is a now very kind of basic, very intuitive um, kind of way of getting quickly started creating these kinds of story experiences which makes it really great for classroom use. We spent about the last 15 minutes of class just playing around with twine for a bit. Uh, and what was really gratifying was, aside from one or two questions, students grokked it really quickly and were able to start playing around and creating stuff. Uh, if students continue to do so for a few hours after class and wrote a metacognitive, a thinking about their thinking, reflection, then they're able to uh, have this count as one of their semester tasks. I'll be interested to see what comes of it. Uh, they don't have to finish something in order to get that kind of credit. They just have to play around with it for more than 15 minutes uh, that we have in class. To lead up to that experience, we had some pre-class reading and playing. Um, so we read primarily Addie Robertson's uh, text Adventures, How Twine Remade Gaming, uh, which came out earlier this year, and played two of the games, kind of choice of two, um, of the games that are mentioned by Robertson in that piece. Uh, Property and Charity Hardscapes Howling Dogs from 2010, and Matthew S. Burns, The Writer Will Do Something from 2017. Both of these are freely available for you to play in your browser of choice. Um, and so we use those primarily howling dogs, I think, as the focus for our discussion about, you know, how do you explain this game to your grandma, to a professor in another, um, you know, class you're taking, to your best friend, uh, to someone at a party? Like, what is this thing? Um, and how is it uh, successful or is it successful? And so we talked a little bit about the notion of games that make us uncomfortable through the experience that they're telling. Howling Dogs is a very kind of locked room experience, which I was worried might be a little bit triggering given, um, you know, we all remember pan confinement in the pandemic, um, which isn't to say that the pandemic is over, just that right now around here, most of us are not confined at home, even if we should be. Um, we're in a different headspace. We're not, we're, I'm teaching this class in person after all. Um, the writer will do something is a little bit safer in terms of, you know, if you're, if you out there are thinking about teaching these kinds of texts, it's a meditation on the experience of video game development. Um, so a little bit meta and nice for a class like this, but also kind of emotionally removed from the day-to-day -day lives of the folks who are participating. Um, but uh, what Howling Dogs really gave us was the ability to talk about, um, you know, the value of art that can potentially make us uncomfortable, um, that deals with challenging subject matter. And one of the really great examples that came up in class is horror movies and haunted houses, um, experiences that we give ourselves up to in part because, uh, you know, I am not a horror um, professional, uh, so I lean to my betters for a lot of what I'm learning, I've learned in this space. But there is a, there's a particular visceral pleasure that is very closely, you know, endorphin wise connected between being scared and laughing and other kinds of things that work on our nervous system. Um, and uh, there's also a certain train of thought that argues that the kind of controlled space of, uh, you know, a game or a, a narrative 
uh, can be a safe space in which to experience something intense. We can walk away from a game. We can walk away from a viewing experience. We got a little bit more sophisticated in our discussion thereafter, thinking about how multilinearity or nonlinearity plays into this. I mean, I remember at the turn of the millennium when there was a belief that these forms of fiction, these nonlinear forms of fiction were going to be the next big thing. Um, meanwhile, I brought up on that on Twitter this morning, someone who's more of a kind of literary uh, type of person was asking about examples of second person fiction and everyone was like well I don't know about any second person fiction and then two of us were able to say hey you know there's an entire genre of interactive fiction that's kind of predicated on the idea that you that there's a you and that's a kind of it couldn't be a very specifically imagined you or it can be a, very, a not especially uh specifically imagined you but it was very interesting for me to bring to the attention of my students the idea that 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 there's those are two completely separate discourse communities and communities of making art and thinking about art that like do not seem to know each other right that literary fiction seems totally oblivious to the idea that there's all of this experimentation happening in terms of what fiction is and how it does and its relationship to linearity which then became a discussion about um you know why why hasn't multilinearity like really become part of the mainstream um, which became some really interesting ideas around, you know, is mass media and pop culture inherently linear because that's comforting in some way, shape, or form. When we don't have to choose, we don't feel responsible it was another thing that came up in class. And then, of course, I had a student who brought up the fact that, in fact, Netflix has um, you saw a couple of choose-your-own-adventure experimentations in um, storytelling, um, and there are a couple of other examples, uh, you know, sprinkled throughout pop culture, um, but the student actually had to kind of narrativize uh, this Netflix experience because the rest of us were like, wait, what? Wait, this is a thing? And I asked, like, you were engaged. You clearly went through all the, the paths. Do you recommend this? And like, no, it was the pandemic. It was like at that part of the pandemic when I was really bored and like I was doing it to do it. I don't know that I would necessarily recommend it, which, okay, fair. Um, but it is really interesting to kind of think about the that. And I found myself, one student had brought up Aristotle's mimesis, um, which was really smart of them to do. Aristotle, as you might recall, or maybe you don't, has this idea of um, the highest, best form of art is that which most closely resembles the real. Uh, be that real emotion, real representation of things or people. Um, and we haven't entirely lost that notion that that's an important and powerful way of assessing um, the, the, the impact and the artistic success of a work of art. Um, obviously, our notion of what is um, kind of memetically true, what fulfills the memetic contract, so to speak, um, has become more capacious, right? You that's my colleague Sunny Stalter Pace is just down the hallway um, on a Thursday afternoon talking about modernism, which really kind of blows open the notion that um, you know it it equates to realism in some way, shape, or form. No, 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 no. Something can be abstracted and still get to some kind of expression of truth. And so we need to push that open. And of course, modernism is over a century old at this point. So we are kind of, I think, at least somewhat kind of uh, familiar, again, kind of like um, we are familiar with hyperlinks and how to navigate them, even though we might not be really great as we weren't in class about defining what hypertext is. Um, because we just kind of live surrounded by it. It's no longer the big new thing that people are writing about endlessly, um, which it was when I was their age, um, or most students' age. Not all of my students are traditional college age. Um, so it was a really rich and generative discussion about, you know, kind of art and its form. Um, and at the end, um, one of the things that I kind of planted the seed of was you know, one could argue that the reason why nonlinear or multilinear narrative doesn't have popular attraction in our culture is 
because of that kind of mimetic call, right? We are pe- we are creatures that live um, kind of in one direction. We are moving toward the future. But of course, we know that's also not entirely true, right? How many of us actually truly live in the present? We are creatures of memory and we are creatures of planning. We are thinking about multiple possibilities for the future or our fears about Uh, what will come ahead. I know I am at the moment. And we also look back and think about not just what has occurred, but what could have occurred and what other paths are possible. And of course, this is also the question of theoretical physics and the space kind continuum. And, you know, it always comes back to that sort of thing. So is linearity a truly, the truly the only path to mimesis? I leave it open. Um, these are the kinds of conversations that are, don't have very clear answers, but they are the terms of the debates that are happening when we talk about what's good, what's satisfying, and why things are popular and why they're not. And the answer is a lot more complicated than any, any of that, because we are also under capitalism. We have to think about things like markets. I also talked a little bit, and this is where I pivot to a little bit of talking about teaching and the choices that I make. I talked about with my students today the fact that Robertson in that piece talks about a lot of games. um, And I didn't assign all of them as a kind of choose your own adventure for this class session. And one of the most notable choices I did not make was... I didn't assign Zoe Quinn's depression quest, although it's now linked on Canvas and I'll link it in the notes here. And I do so, I have a lot of feelings about that. There's a couple of reasons. One, Howling Dogs is close enough to the pandemic moment alone in terms of how it potentially could could trigger folks. It's still removed um, enough that I felt safe assigning it without fearing that I was going to potentially push on student boundaries. And of course, students could choose to play the other game and not ever touch Howling Dogs. Depression Quest is visceral. It comes with a lot of warnings. Um, It is the experience of what it is like to be living with depression. That's its power. That's why it is so renowned as an empathy engine. But of course, it's also renowned for another reason. And that was something I also got into with my students which is to say, I've loved games my whole life. I don't know a time when I wasn't playing games in one way or another, especially these kinds of storytelling games. As I told students today, I grew up on text adventures. They're my, they were my first introduction to gaming. Playing later generations of what you know t- were text-based games, you know, all the way from the like ones where you wrote the prompt, on a kind of black, um, you know, screen, all the way into growing up alongside the form with the kind of golden age of adventure games in the 1990s. Uh, This is why I love watching Amy Dolan play King's Quest on Twitch, because it reminds me of playing along with my siblings um, and wanting to look up the cheat codes on CompuServe and the walkthroughs, but that was expensive and we probably shouldn't do it too often. Um, It's wild to me that I can pull up the entire walkthrough for Monkey Island or another LucasArts game and blaze through it in ways that I couldn't as a kid. Um, I love those games. Why did it take me until I was 40 to teach them? It's not because of Part of it is the climate. Part of it is the world that we live in. We're in this fantastic moment for the resurgence of role-playing games. That's true. But another very real reason why I've been skittish about talking about games publicly, posting videos like this, thinking about games in public um, on Twitter and other social media is because I remember Gamergate. Or as I called it on Twitter, the gate that shadows us because of course it's still a thing right it's still triggering to people it can still get you doxxed and dragged and brigaded and it's interesting to kind of be recording this video and thinking about these things while I look at my follower count on Twitter 
which is not, you know, I'm not famous, um, but I'm reaching that threshold number where um, I'm told by colleagues who have surpassed that, often by a lot, that there's a pivot point where it starts to become less of a space where you interact with other folks. Obviously you're doing it in public, but like nobody, but people don't care enough to pay attention to you um, and suddenly you become perceived. I can only imagine what this is like for people who have hundreds of thousands or even millions of followers. Um, but I'm, I'm a small fish in a small pond, but for an academic, the, the number that I'm, that I'm slowly getting to is kind of the moment where you start to get a lot of people criticizing you and you're much more visible. And so I think about all of those things as I explained to my students, you know, one of the reasons why I have not gotten into um, kind of being a public researcher around games, I've been very careful about the kinds of games that I write about, all those sorts of things is because my first indoctrination, not indoctrination, my first introduction to, um, you know, games criticism, game scholarship was through people who looked like me and people who have ideas like mine or curiosities like mine getting ripped to shreds by seemingly unending waves of hostility. Um, I aspire to be like scholars like Kishana Gray, who does amazing work uh, around um, black gaming experiences and much, much more. Um, and I'm so glad that she's in the SEC. Um, because it means that there's potential for collaboration, maybe. Anyway, um, fangirl, fangirl. Um, but I also know that these are dangerous, potentially dangerous spaces. And I'm an 18th centuryist. Most of the time, I don't have to deal with that kind of, um, you know, threat. Um, although the 18th century is extremely relevant, and the 18th century teaches a lot that we can learn about why we are in the pickle that we're in today. Um, but as I think, as I have become more of a, of a kind of, of a thinker in public around these kinds of issues and other kinds of issues that are hot button issues, it's, it's made me a better scholar. It's made me a better thinker, but it also is made me think a lot about, you know, risk assessment. And I'm so glad to, have learned from people like Dorothy Kim and others about, you know, those kinds of safety mechanisms um, and how to be careful. I'm flirting on the edge of things a, uh, on a lot of time, which I can do because I'm a white lady, right? Like my femaleness put, puts me at risk, but not anywhere near as much as um, my um, more visible colleagues of color. That's just reality. Um, and so these are the balancing acts and the meta of, um, you know, topics like these and these things that, you know, that I, that I'm thinking about, um, in this particular moment, um, which is to say to my colleagues who are, who are watching this at the end and Hey, my, maybe my students have followed this to the end too. I think that's valuable, important, um, that this is. This is important stuff and you know it's important because it's not without risk. Um, and we have to be careful of ourselves and our students um, when we play, so to speak, in these spaces because it isn't really, in the end, all fun and games. Um, that said, it was a week of great joy in the middle of a lot of crap. Um, and so, I'm including, um, for those of you who would like to explore alongside us, um, the links to spaces of text adventures and interactive fiction that I've shared with students, including um, throwback stuff like text adventures and web adventures all the way through to the interactive fiction archive, iFiction, and of course the still producing choice of games. There's a lot more that we didn't get to in class, and I'm hoping that if students get interested in it, because reading a work of interactive fiction and engaging with it totally counts as a potential task for the semester, um, I'm hoping that they get inspired and excited uh, by something that they find. Next week, we finally get to Dungeons and Dragons, or as I'm calling it, the obligatory week on Dungeons and Dragons. For those of you who'd like to prepare, 
Um, we're going to be taking a look for the students who are totally new to D&D um, to the 2019 recording of Stephen Colbert and Matthew Mercer playing a one-on-one -on -one one shot for Red Nose Day. It's the most compact introduction to what the play of D&D looks like um, that I've yet come across. Actual plays are great, um, but because Stephen has to be kind of reminded of uh, what D&D is like and also brought up to speed with the new edition, um, if it, it kind of functions as an introduction uh, to the viewer. Uh, there's going to be more D&D &D viewed by these students uh, in the weeks to come when we talk about actual play in week five, uh, but this is a good swift start because we're also reading from Analog Game Studies, Alex Chalk's A Chronology of Dungeons and Dragons in Popular Media. That's Tuesday, uh, and we're also going to be making characters for the first time using D&D Beyond. Um, on Thursday, we're going to get go deep dive into questions about representation and credit um, in and out of the game of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, thinking about um, representations of Asia, representations of peoples of color and cultures of color all over the place, as well as thinking about how women have been depicted at both as their participants in the creation of the game and the further development of the game, as well as how they've been depicted in different editions of D&D. &D. Um, so the good, the bad, and the ugly of a game I love, and of course is the most popular role-playing game in the world, TM. Um, we have to do it. And as I talked about in my video on Tuesday, I am wrestling with the win and the how, but we're gonna see how it lands here in week four. We are almost to a whole month of this class. It has been so much fun. So if you have questions and you are my student, you've got the Discord, you've got my email, you've got Canvas, you've got my attention um, and good wishes. If you're not and you're watching this, feel free to put a comment or a question below. Keep it civil, please. Um, don't make me, don't make my fears come true. Um, or you can tweet at me at Freed, F-R-I-E-D-E. -E. And we'll see you next week because it's Thursday and it's time for a break. Bye.